and welcome back to kimchi crime podcast it's been a couple of weeks now we seem to be getting a very inconsistent schedule which is uh not great but we all have things that are happening in our lives it's my fault i'll just say it it's my fault i was waiting for you to say it thank you it's my fault yes yes things happen you know you had that crazy hiccup thing yep and then uh you know i had some family issues and then uh, i got like a Dino virus, you know who gets a Dino virus? Kids gets a Dino virus. Yeah, well, and then I ended up getting. I lost my voice. Uh, I haven't been able to work for the past few days now, which is like a first in my fourteen years of uh, broadcasting. But uh, I should be all right. I might, I might start, you know, time and time out. I might uh, turn off my audio. That's probably because I'm probably coughing my brains out. But yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know you offered to do this week. By yourself, but I couldn't let you go, man. This is a we have a good story today, but we also got some updates, right? Yes, actually, uh, SA, you have the update for us of a story that we covered not too long ago. Yeah, uh, Chung Yu Jung, which, ha- which happens to be the very first like story that we covered, right? Uh, the yeah. story of a, a girl in her 20s uh, who decided she wanted to kill somebody just for the hell of it, and uh, she does end up killing a tutor. And uh, she's got her sentence now. Um, it's she's probably going to appeal this, but the mm-hmm. initial sentencing she got is she's got life in prison. Uh, she's um, a lifer. She's a lifer. Yeah, she's. I mean, she's in what? She's like twenty something years old, right? And that's a lot yeah. of years that she's going to be behind bars. But the only thing is, usually what happens with stories like this is they appeal, right? Yeah. And so she's going to try to. Her lawyers are probably going to say she's like psychotic. She's got like mental issues, and they're going to try to cut it down to like you know, 17 and maybe 20 years, mm. uh, there is a good chance that it's going to go, you know, sentence it down. But uh, for now, what we know is life in prison. And um, I have to well, say, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's I've we've we've talked about death sentences, right? And the goods right. and the bads. Right, right. And, like, and, I know that they were actually going to ask for the death sentence for her. But like, as we said, it hasn't happened for so long. So kind of what's the point anymore? It's more symbolic than anything, right? Mm. So it just did the brutality of her murder maybe gives her the case for the the death penalty. But uh, like you said, yeah, I mean, what's the point when they've never really handed down uh, an execution in in many, many years? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, I I think eventually Korea will probably abolish it just to be honest with you, because it just doesn't seem like they're going to go through with any of the, uh current um de- people on death row right and some of the killers that we've talked about in the past are still on death row yeah so uh you know the crazy thing is it's like you know there's the uh, the un human rights council yes and so like every year what they do is they score countries with uh, mm. however uh you know how good their human rights is and they had the guts to score down korea because they have death penalty. And I'm going here. They haven't executed anybody in years, man. It's like decades. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, like, they're, they're going to score and down just because of the. Well, I mean, technically, I guess it's still there, right? But it's uh, still there, but like, no one's used it. Like, no, I don't know. No. I'm sort of curious as to maybe it's just the sentencing, like, uh, processing career is just so lazy and they haven't gotten around to it. Or I don't know what's happening, but Dude, there's too much politics that go with that, man. That's true. Korea yeah. is very like Korea is one of the most you think America's patriotic. I think Korea is super patriotic when it comes to like politics and everything like that. So, but that's another story. And today we're actually going to go back to where it all began with Korea, not all began, but a very dark period yeah in korean history now we're not going to talk about the actual war because that happened in the 19 or around 1949 and we're going to actually talk about a person and i think to be honest with you this might be our last serial killer because i think we've probably covered a lot of them if not all of them there should be a few more left there should be a few more left. I know that we're getting down to a few left, but uh, like uh, maybe we'll cover more different cases, right. uh, more victim cases, etc. But there yeah, are tons yeah. out there to talk about. What was it? The, the guy that we're going to be talking about was born in 1949, the Korean War. 
Yeah. Uh, happened in 1950 to 1953. But even after the Korean War was done and over with, Korea was not in a very good state of point. And in fact, there was a point in time in the 60s and 70s where North Korea yeah. actually had a bigger economy than South Korea. They were actually doing pretty well. Yeah. Uh, North Korea was recovering so much better. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is not North Korea talk, but North Korea kind of started going downhill once they started developing like their military and they're doing their whole nuclear stuff and not feeding their people and so forth. But mm. yeah, Korea was, they weren't doing too well. Uh, let's right. just put it at that. Right, right. And today we're going to be talking about a case that happened around that time, right? Yeah. And this is, you know, what's interesting is you brought up this particular uh, criminal that we're going to talk about. And I've heard of this guy. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, right, the worst name that you could give to your child. And I was telling Walter, I was like, dude, man, if, if I was named this, I'm mm -hmm. not saying what he did was right, mm -hmm. but I might be a little bit psychotic and I might start <laughs> going off on the society if I was given this name because his name is Kim Daedu. Right. And I don't know for our listeners out there, I don't know how good your Korean is and stuff like that. Daedu is hancha, right? Mm -hmm. So te is big. Yep. You is your head. And so when you call someone a big head, you call them a Tedu. So he's big head Kim. Yes, he's his Kim big head. <laughs> he's Kim big head. And the ironic thing about this guy is, is like he's like one of the smaller killers that we've seen before. He's a that small is. guy. I wonder like what they were thinking. Do you think like when they, he was born, he just had a huge head and they were like, we're just going to call him big Dude, head. Man, they had weird like names Back in the days, I remember back when I used to go to church in New York, my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the pastor's wife, her name was Chin Sang. Uh, and oh. Chin Sang is like like a bad customer, right? Like, yeah, a, yeah, like, yeah. A, like a Karen, for instance. Yeah. And so we used to call her Chin Sang Samonim. And it's like, but it had a good meaning. It meant like the truth and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so I'm sure Tedu means something, like to become a big person or I don't know, uh, like a wise person, a lot of a lot in his head and stuff like that. But over time, it just evolved into a weird thing where you call a person with big head a Tedu. And we're, we're going to talk about Tedu today. All right. So let's get straight into it, SJ. Yeah. So like you said, he was born in 1949, but November of 1949 in uh, Yangnam County in South Chola province. And here's the weird thing. Um, he died back in 1976. It's been mm -hmm. decades since he died. But what's interesting is that his name started trending on social media platform like Twitter or X, whatever you call it, as to where he was. And I mean, it's not that many people knew about his story. Like mm. they all knew is that he was a dangerous man. And that for some reason, they all thought that he was still very much alive and that his name was popping up. But so now, if he was still alive to this day, he'd be like, what, almost about 80 something. Oh, super old. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah this yeah. guy's like older than my parents right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by some years, but he would be still alive. I mean, it's yep. not like a super, super uh, old age. Mm -hmm. But going back to his uh, childhood, uh, this is kind of the unusual one because he was the eldest of seven siblings in total. Mm -hmm. And I'm the eldest in my family. And usually the eldest are the normal ones. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, him, obviously not the case here uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of pressure. Yeah. A lot of pressure when you're the elder and you're the elder son, right? And so mm. this sort of pressure kind of passed down from his parents who are, again, quite poor. I mean, they were mm -hmm. looking at their son as a person to one day get him out of poverty. Mm. And so this is even after the Korean War, right? Korea's South Korea's rebuilding. They're mm. trying to rejuvenate. And so kids were sort of a source of income in the future. And because right. you were the eldest son in the family, there was a lot of pressure. And this was, again, a, a very common cultural habit that many Koreans possess and even argue that, you know, the eldest is not always the best to be in the Korean family. There's even, you know, women out there who go, I'm not going to get married into the eldest son is what right. some of the people say. And I, I, I still got married. So I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, for you, you're the eldest. Did you feel that pressure at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, like, you know, I have a younger brother, but it's, you know, if we get same score, I yeah. get in trouble. You know, <laughs> if I and do something wrong, I get in trouble. He doesn't. I have to succeed. And it goes again. And I happen to be the eldest, not only in my in my family, mm -hmm. but my entire family. Oh, wow. And so my grandfather had this crazy thing where, like, if you're the eldest grandson of the Lee family and you're you're the Chunju Lee of the, the mm -hmm. royalty line and stuff like that, you have to be this and you have to be that. 
he was like, at the age of six, he was like, you got to go to Harvard. You got to go to Yale, Princeton. <laughs> and if all fails, just go to West Point. I was like, all fails, go to West Point. <laughs> but, Hard. Well, this actually is a good segue because he actually got something about his schooling days, right? Yeah, exactly. And so during his schooling days, I, you know, mm. Kim was not the student that his parents wanted him to be because mm. you know, he failed his exams to get into top middle school. Uh, he even later dropped out at the age of 17, which I think it was pretty good. I mean, he got there around until 17. Mm. Uh, parents' dreams of one day getting out of poverty just kind of seems to be more distant every year. And I could only imagine affected the relationship between Kim Dae-do and his parents. But yeah. instead of getting that high paying job, he moved around here and there around Korea, ended up in Seoul. And again, I mean, moving to Seoul might have not been the best idea <laughs> because it was the start of, you know, a long list of unfortunate events that happens afterwards. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I'm, I, I, his move to Seoul was where everything kind of started. But like, even like back then, Seoul was the land of opportunity in Korea. And for Koreans, they all wanted to move to Seoul. And it was where all the jobs were. Still to this day, it's oh, yeah. mostly where many Koreans want to go to. I mean, these days, Gyeonggi is getting a little bit more po popular. Uh, think of Gyeonggi as like the, like, Seoul is the egg yolk and Gyeonggi is like the egg white. It's just surrounding Seoul. But uh, it's still the place where everyone wants to be. Everyone wants to work in a Gangnam company or, yeah. or somewhere like that. But Kim actually thought of going to the military. I mean, it is mandatory here in Korea for men to go to the military. But maybe he was thinking more on the lines of after I finish my mandatory service that I'll just stay in the military. But actually, he wasn't even allowed into the military because he was knocked back due to, like uh, SJ mentioned, his small, weak frame. He couldn't even get into the military. I mean, that's, I, I don't know, that may, might be a godsend to some because I know that a lot of men these days, they, they really want to avoid the military. And I guess the only way you can do it is be extremely overweight or extremely underweight. So. Yeah. And in like, this case, and, and you know, back in the days, you have to understand nowadays, it's like what 18, 19 months in, in, in military, but back then it was like almost three years. Right. So you're oh, you're losing yeah. about three years of your career in the military. It wasn't, it wasn't even that long ago when it was like two, two, two or two years, or I think it was like yeah, yeah, 10, yeah. 10, 15 years ago. It was like two years they, they reduced it or something. It was a little bit more than two years, and they, they reduced it now less to less than uh, it's like an, a year and a half now, right? Right, right. And um, but yes, I, I feel very lucky to be living in uh near Seoul, but also yeah, you almost say you live in Seoul because we live no, both we, we both got kicked out of Seoul because it was so expensive. It was so expensive, and so that we had to like basically move next to each other just to survive. <laughs> but we both work in Seoul. That's right, the thing. right, 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 right. And it's a doggy dog world in that in that area, but we both work in Seoul. But back to the story of Kim, you know, he had no skills. Uh, you know, the next best thing in his mind, I guess, at that age, at that time, is to turn to crime. So yeah. his first run in with the law was an assault case, as well as evidence tampering, which saw him spend a short time in prison. I think this was actually during the assault case as well, that he was tampering with some of the uh, uh, evidence. I'll have to look into that more. But now, after he got out, he tried to clean up his act uh, by applying to factories. So Maybe there was a good mindset in him at first, but you'll see later on that it changes very, very dark. Um, you know, he went to try and apply for like labor work at factories, make an honest living. But the problem now was because of his assault charge, he's now a convicted criminal and that was permanently on his record, which saw a lot of applications being shunned. So he was you know, poor, dirt poor. And to be honest with you, not even his family was going to help him out. They rejected him because also he was a convicted criminal. They didn't yeah, want to be yeah. associated with him anymore. So now he's being rejected from society and he's being rejected by his own family. I'm sure he is very, very uh, bitter. I mean, SJ, yeah. in the day like today, you, you have a very popular radio show and, and you have reporters going in and out. Let's say uh, you, you get a guy who is relatively, you know, good on good on the mic, but has a criminal record for assault and stealing. Would you hire them? No. No. Because, okay. no, because I, the thing is, I mean, the image of the show, 
I mean, yeah. I, I do a news program. Mm, oh, that's true. Yes. <laughs> and so if, if I do a news show and I hire, and, and I guess it, it, it depends on the extent. Mm. If it was like maybe petty theft when they were mm. like super young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I have friends who have, who have had like criminal records and they've they mm -hmm. strained their lives and they have a very normal career and things like that. Mm. Uh, maybe, but I just feel like back then it was just different because the competition was even worse. Mm. You have to understand back then, right? When he was trying to get these jobs, he must have, let's say he was born in 49. If he's trying to get his job, it must have been in his 70s right now. And right. most of the jobs that are available at the time were at textile factories. Mm. And so these are people with no education. These are people right. literally, some of them didn't even graduate elementary school. And yeah. so when they don't have a lot of education and there's everybody who haven't gotten any education, you don't want these criminal records because that's going to be the only thing that's going to be stopping you from getting it because everyone else, either you're, you're competing with people who are high school dropouts mm. and that's actually considered good. You're competing yeah. with people who are middle school dropouts mm. and that's considered not so bad. But mm. if you if you end up being a high school dropout, but with the criminal record, they're not going to hire you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It was it was a big thing back then for sure. Oh, it really was a big thing, and especially because uh, back then we've talked about how the law was so much more strict. Mm. And so, if you have like a criminal record, uh, that means even though if it's like small stuff, like it looks bigger than what it is back then. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that. I mean, he's been getting rejected just by the society, and, uh, you know. And I'm sorry to say, I wouldn't hire a person with a criminal record, but that's only because, again, you know, just just my show. But, anyways, um, you can kind of tell, like you said, yeah. there's there's this sort of trend that we see where people get ousted by the society, they get ousted mm. by their uh, peers and things like that. Uh, Kim, obviously. Uh, going through a bit of uh, this and his petty crimes, unfortunately, become more a little more serious, right? And I yeah, think yeah. so. At this point of his life, I mean, it really is his breaking uh, period. Like he's helpless, hmm. he's hopeless. Most of all, angry, right? And this guy, he has nothing to lose right now. It's 1975. Yeah, the guy needs money with no job, no help. The only way to get this was to steal. You of know what, what? What? So he has. He already has a criminal record. What's gonna? What? What's another? criminal record on you know what's that going to do he needs to survive right and so the location of his very first serious crime was Gwangjushi in Gyeonggi-do province and Kim Dae-do he broke into a house where an elderly couple lived in in order to steal what he could but hmm. a scuffle broke out when the elderly man found Kim so mm -hmm. Kim then killed the 63 old man with a scythe mm -hmm. and then went on to attack the old man with uh leaving her uh with the the old man's wife leaving her yeah, seriously yeah. injured as well and now for those of you guys who don't know what a scythe is, I, yeah. I played enough Diablo 2 to know what a scythe <laughs> is. Um, usually, if you are working in the fields, uh, let's yeah. say like the grains, mm. uh, a lot of like long grasses that you have to cut, you know, like the Grim Reaper. Yes. Like that's a scythe. And oh, yeah. so that's a deadly, deadly weapon. That's a and, brutal weapon to kill someone with. Oh, it absolutely is. And so yeah. we don't know if like Kim's intention was actually to kill. Uh, because, you know, the main reason for why he broke in was, you know, burglary. I mean, we've mm -hmm. talked about other killers where they went in to kill them and then rob their stuff. But he, I think he just really wanted the money or whatever it was. And then he was just trying to protect himself. Uh, mm -hmm. But after the murder, he caught a train to Suncheon, uh, really not far from his hometown. And while on the train, he meets up with another ex-convict by the name of Kim Ho-un. And mm -hmm. they decide, well, hey. You are a convict. I'm a convict. Let's buddy up here like SJ and Walter. Mm. Kimchi Crime Podcast. Let's do yes. this. Yes. Six days after the first murder, the two enter a shop in Muon County. This one run by a couple in their mid-50s. Mm -hmm. This time it seems like there was an intention to kill because also present at the shop was the owner's a seven-year-old grandson who they also killed along with the couple. Mm. And they stole, the two stole, 250 Korean won. Now, granted, if you take that, okay, right now, hmm. it's about, I would say, 20 cents. Yeah. All right, Very 20 right. cents, but like uh, 70s, it would get you, uh, it would get you a nice meal. 
Yeah, that's true. But right? still, like, it but seems still, it's petty. not worth yeah. killing three people over, right? Yeah. And yeah, some yeah. drinks, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So it wasn't a very successful robbery. I don't think it was worth killing three people, especially a seven year old, a seven year old grandson. Yeah. Uh, who was kind of in there. And then what did they do? It probably cost them more to buy the tickets, but they made right. their way to Seoul again. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the means to continue with their crimes, but part of ways before the next attack was conducted. Mm -hmm. September 11th, Kim goes to the district of Chungnang district where it's in Northeast Seoul. And he enters a house of a 60 year old man, kills him. No reported motive was reported mm -hmm. via the media. And then in September 25th, he travels to Pyeongtaek, which at the time, uh, was a huge remote countryside. Now it's it's a developing city, right? It's yeah. got the uh, the military base there as well. And he breaks into a house where a 70 year old woman and her three grandchildren, aged seven, five, and eleven, are. Hmm. And so you're seeing once again, he's targeting these older and younger victims. Right. And this time he goes from using a scythe to using a meat cleaver, and you can kind of guess what happens afterwards. Yes. So when the police arrived on the scene, they said that the bodies of the grandmother and the children were so badly beaten that they were just practically unrecognizable. Mm. And that they said it inflicted so many strikes on the victims that the meat cleaver handle broke. He's like angry. Yeah, that's a lot of force. Yeah. But his sickness just didn't stop there. Mm. Uh, the 11-year-old, remember, was also there, mm. saw all of this. And then mm. Kim dragged her outside with the intention of raping her. Mm. Now, this goes into a next level thing. All right. Yeah. Murder is one thing, and a raping of an 11 year old is just a whole nother thing. Mm. Uh, he did fail to do so. And when he tried mm. to tie, you know, tie her to a tree with a, a large cloth that Koreans used as a carrier, uh, tragically, the 11 year old also died from suffocation. And so, yeah. So, I mean, it just seems like as time goes by, crimes are just getting worse and worse. And it's not even like, by day, it's like by moment, right? It's just getting exactly. worse and worse and worse. And so, I it's just you know, you see the picture of this guy, and he doesn't look like a very dangerous person, but you look at his actions, and he is probably one of the most brutal criminals in the history of Korean history. I mean, especially with this last like case that we just heard here with the. You know, the five-year-old, the seven-year-old, and the 11-year-old, and also the old lady. I mean, to to beat them so brutally that they're unrecognizable to where a meat cleaver handle broke. I mean, that guy has obviously massive, massive anger issues. And, you know, you and I, we're, we, we're freelancers. We work hard, man. We, we, we understand what it's like to lose a job, and we understand what it's like to get a job and we really try hard to keep onto it but i've never been in a situation where regardless of you know i haven't had a job or not to do or even think about doing what this guy has done but yeah it's, it's not just the brutality of the crimes it's actually more so just how close they were together i mean this guy in this so far there was nine victims right in about a month and a bit yeah that's a lot of people he in Here's the thing. His spree didn't stop there. Like two days later, after that uh, very horrific crime with the three children and the grandmother, three more victims are brutally murdered. This time, a family living in Goody, uh, a 40-year-old father, 37-year-old mother, and their three-year-old child. He seems to go for families a lot. Uh, he kills the father. He rapes and kills the mother and beats the three-year-old child to death. He also wounded two others uh, in the process. They were unnamed. They could have been family friends. But the fact that he was able to carry out this whole entire um, scene with so many people around. I mean, like you said, he's small. I, I just don't know how he would have done it. But, you know, I think that's the thing. I think he catches them off guard. I think that's you know, it, a lot yeah. of these people like, you know, you see the small guy and they're not very scared by him you're not yeah you know, you're not going to get intimidated by him but he packs a punch right i mean he, he packs a psychotic punch right right he's he's very like he's just a bulldog he's just like very small but he could really really attack you so at yeah. this point you know it doesn't seem to be about the money anymore it just it first is murder followed by what he can gather from there it just seems like he's just out to kill 
Now, the incredibly sad thing is that he has the mind to kill young innocent children as well, because yeah. only three days later, the next killing was in Gunpo area, and this time a young mother who was also raped. He then killed her three-month-year-old child. So uh, he doesn't have any... At this point, he's completely like so, psych- he's a psychopath because yeah. he has no feelings towards children, no feelings towards women, no feelings towards anybody. He hates society. He wants to get it back. He wants to get his revenge back. Um, but he still continued two days later. I mean, remember, I'm talking about adding on from that month and a bit from when SJ started talking. I'm still yeah. talking about his run and it's coming in like day frequencies. So two days later, Kim then made his way to the south, uh, south to the city called Suwon. Now, on October 2nd, he murdered a young couple. Now, after those killings, the very next day, he tries to kill a caddy at a golf course in Suwon. This time, though, he fails and the victim survives. Now, he is reported to the police. Uh, he has left because this person obviously needed to report it. But he panics and then he goes back to Seoul. However... He has one last killing, and his lung, one last killing is somewhat interesting as Kim tried to recruit another ex-convict Jeez. to help him out with his crimes. I mean, what? Like, it sounds like he was like trying to get people together, like a clan together to kill all these people. That's what it sounded like. Um, much like his first partner, it sounded like he wanted to go out, maybe steal some money, but mainly kill. But this ex-convict and uh, Kim Daedu actually had got into a fight. And the ex-convict stole Kim's belongings and tried to make a runner. But then Kim caught up with him and then killed him as Dude. well. But here's the interesting thing. He stole his jeans in the process. Hey, now. jeans were expensive back in the days. Yeah, they're still expensive, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> but, like, this would be his final murder. So starting from August 13th until October 7th, 1975, which is 55 days in total, he's killed 17 people. So basically every week, almost. Yeah. (laughs) Well, he's averaging about, uh, let's see, one murder, every one person every three days, almost a little bit. Yeah. But you, you know what I think it is? It's like, like, I think you made a good point, Walter. Like, it's not even about the money anymore. Yeah, you know, like again, it goes back to he, he has like, what is that called? The, the Napoleon, uh, syndrome complex, <laughs> complex, complex. There you go, the Napoleon yeah. complex, and so he's this guy who's now power tripping this small guy who's able to just kill people and mm. overpower them, and he's feeding off of that. Remember, mm. he's always been the underdog all his life, man. He's been, he was the, the first child, but he's never met up to, you know, his parents' expectations. He wasn't able to graduate. His grades weren't good enough. He wasn't getting the jobs. You know, he's got a police criminal uh, criminal record and stuff like that. Everything was going against him and he's just kind of failing in everything. But when he's able to dominate people, and I've heard in a lot of cases, and you studied criminology, Walter, mm, mm. like people feed off of the idea that they're just able to overpower them. And for yeah. a small guy like him to be able to kill this many people, oh, he absolutely loves this right now. It's very sadistic. That's basically what it is. When you're when you have that power over someone, you be you can be very sadistic in oh, that absolutely. way. And that's yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. And so unfortunately, like it catches up to him though, because like you said, I mean, it was his last murder. And you mm. know, we're now getting into how he sort of got caught. And it it goes back to the genes that he stole off. Mm-hmm. Uh, his last victim. So one day, right, like Kim goes to a, a laundromat located in Chengyangyi, and the owner of the laundromat noticed like a fair amount of blood on the jeans and like out of curiosity, like he's like, dude, what happened? Mm. And so he goes, you know, he's trying to go like, you know, ignore it, whatever. And like he get they get someone to, into a fight uh, mm. with a friend. And as a result, the blood on the clothes were, you know, due to the nosebleed. And he's like making up all these stories right now. He's yeah. going, like, it's nothing. It was just a fight and just kind of just wash it off. Come on. Um, so I know that Chongyangyi was mm. kind of a poor area in Seoul once upon a time, and it was mm. home to a, a red light district, a lot of criminal activity, gangs ran the street. There was also a major train station that went through it. Yeah. And so I think because of the idea that maybe just the, the neighborhood in itself, uh, the laundromat owner was just a little bit suspicious given the yeah. amount of 
crime that he's probably seen. And mm. and he's not dumb, right? Yeah. Like like it's blood on the jeans. The guy's probably like washed up worse stuff uh, mm. before. Uh, so the laundromat owner decides to call the police on Kim, to which his return was met with the police and then arrested Kim, stuck to his story of being in a fight with his friend and then changing the story to the local gangs beating him up. But this was proven false when the police interviewed the gangs, which I feel it's, weird. It's, it's, it's kind of funny in a way. They're like, did you beat this man up? I'm like, no, we don't even know who he is. It's like, we beat up many people. We didn't beat up this guy. No, no. The fact that they actually <laughs> went to the gangs, right? Like, sir, did you gang up on this person? Like, they're not going to say yes, first of I'm all. But I'm, I'm sure the police and the gangs back then were a bit like. Oh, they're they were tighter. Pro- yeah, yeah. They, they, were had, they, they had their sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. So like. <laughs> After more interrogation, like Kim came up, you know, gave up his story about the fight with his ex config and then, you know, proceeded to confess all the murders that came before it. Right. I think he was kind of like, you know what? Forget it. Um, yeah. Confirmed the locations and the victims and said he was enjoying the time of killing. And maybe in addition to it, uh, given the amount of people he killed in such a short period of time. And then get this. Remember, when he was first doing it for the money, the total amount that Kim looted was around twenty six thousand eight hundred Korean one, mm. which is like under twenty dollars. Yeah. Um, sure back then maybe it was a bit more um, yeah still not a lot when you think about it though no like a 20 like let's say 20 us dollars back in like what 30 34 years like maybe around maybe 500 bucks maybe so ish. i yeah so i would say that a person um would be getting paid that for their salary yeah, yeah like yeah. a one month salary that's in the true. 70s depending on where they work would be that so after all of this all he got out of it was a month's salary really yeah but like we i don't i don't mean to make light of the subject but he did basically do two months worth of no, work I, oh, that's true that, that's true yeah very yeah, true. yeah but anyway yeah it seemed that you know he had the taste for killing rather than you know trying to survive in this world i mean most of the people he killed, you know, they weren't from wealthy backgrounds. And like we said, Korea was still poor at that time. Uh, and instead, there were, you know, just these small families, usually just honest families, should we say. Yeah. Now, in mid-March 1976, he was convicted of 17 counts of murder, three rapes and a robbery, plus an attempted robbery as well. Now, at the time, the death sentence was well established, unlike today. Now, Kim had the option of appealing, but turned it down and the death penalty was given. And he died on December 28th, 1976 by hanging. And he said, even though it's kind of conflicting with what he said before with, you know, he enjoyed it. But he said he has remorse after he confirmed to Christianity and confessed to regretting his sins. So I think he was trying to get into heaven just before you know, it, it all went down, but yeah, I, know, I believe him. But to be honest with you, after going through this case, I thought the brutality of uh, the murders was very sickening, but I just can't get over how such a small man, small, small, small man can just do so much chaos. No, I think, again, I, I think it's the, the perfect example of what Napoleon complex is all about. Mm. I mean, <clears throat> Yeah, he wasn't doing it for the money at one point. Hmm. I, I have to say, of all the criminals that we've covered, and I know we haven't really covered a whole lot, hmm. it's, you know, there, we had talked about some people that, like Shin Chang Wan, right? Hmm. Uh, you know, we talked about how much money he was kind of getting out of it to the point where, like, he was making donations and stuff like that. Right. And he was targeting elderly people, too. And he was targeting, like, these rich neighborhoods. I don't even think he was really targeting the right places. Like right. he was really feeding off of the fact that he's able to just overpower them and control their life. Yeah, and I think so. That's all he wanted to. I sure, like again, I don't know how he was even surviving without you know, with all the money that the no money that he had. Hmm. But it's like one of those things where you see all the terrible things that he's done, and you can't feel sorry for the guy at all. But hmm. you kind of do a little bit. The, the the fact that like the only thing that you can feel sorry for him is the amount of pressure that he had on as like a child and you know we are still a conservative country at the moment but i'm sure it was like extremely conservative back then and yes society turned against him um i guess we can't sympathize or empathize with him because we just don't have that situation in us and 
I guess I, here's the thing. When one of the very first questions I got asked uh, when I started criminology was, do you think you could kill somebody? The, 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 the professor asked everybody. Okay. And, you know, everybody gave their answer. And he, he basically said, everybody here in this room, everybody in the world is capable of killing. It's just what is their point? Right. Yeah. And so example, like for me, if anyone, like we've talked about this before, if anyone hurt our family, we, oh, yeah, we yeah. would happily kill them, like kill like someone who hurt our family. And for this guy, his breaking point was being rejected by a society. So I guess that's the only way you can kind of feel sorry for him. But, you know, the the brutality of his, oh, I, go, I go back to the, the ways he killed people was just it was a very very serious and, and the age man bloody yeah 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 it's, the, it's like there's too many kids involved with this right right it, it, to be honest with you it'd probably be more acceptable if it was just like adults but yes he did kill uh very young children who who were very helpless i and, he's, i think he really just got into a point where like he wasn't you know he didn't care for anything anymore there, yeah. there, there was no standards for this guy. Right. As exactly. long as, and, and, and you know what? Look at all the people that he targeted. It's the older people that he could still overpower. It's the kids. Yeah. Like, we forget how vulnerable kids are. Yeah, like, exactly. If we have the power. I know this is going to sound psychotic. Mm. We have the power to lift up a kid mm. and just throw them over to a bridge. Like they yeah. can't do anything about this. And for some mm. people like him, just the idea that you could overpower a human being that much Oh, mm. he's getting so much juice out of that. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think I think that's what was feeding him the whole time was just the the power. Because in reality, he didn't have any power in society. He had no power at home. He didn't have any power. The only way he could get power was to you know go out and kill somebody, and therefore that's what was continuously feeding his addiction to kill. So yeah, and then it turns out his parents named him correctly. He's got a big head afterwards. He does have a big head afterwards and we'll make sure that everyone sees his big head. But yes. that wraps it up for today's episode. If you did like that episode, please leave a like and subscribe. Hopefully no one gets sick in the next no. couple of weeks. Um and we'll have some more cases for you next. But until next time, SJ, we'll see you hopefully next week. All right, we'll see you guys.